Hey guys, so we are ankle deep in atrial rhythms. And so far we've talked about how atrial rhythms have something going on with the P wave. So we've talked about atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. Now let's get into the last atrial rhythm that you're gonna to need to know about. And this one you'll also be talking about when you get to complex, but I think it's great to get an introduction now. It's also what I would call a very classic rhythm for nursing students. So always good to learn about something you might be in while you're studying for this exam. So supraventricular tachycardia, we talked about earlier, it sounds like it's a problem in the ventricles, but um, it's supraventricular. Oh, no, now my thing went away again. All right, sup, let's try again. Ooh, supraventricular and supra means above the ventricles. So um, I mean, supra means above. And then, so this is above the ventricles, tachycardia. What's above the ventricles? The atria. So this is the top of the heart tachycardia. So you're going to notice things that are going to make it look like a top of the heart problem because one, look at this QRS. Look at all these QRSs. They're skinny. We've got skinny QRSs. We've got a regular rhythm. Look at this same stuff. There's the same amount of space between each thing. This is beautiful. It's like the um, ants go marching. You know, it's just like this beautiful back to back to back rhythm. Um, uh, but the one thing I'm noting is where are my P waves? These things here are my T waves, but where are my P waves? What happened to you, buddy? Um, where are you? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm kind of putting like where, what happened to my P wave? So we also know this to be a tachycardia. So I'm looking for a uh, fast rhythm, which I have a rate that's greater than 150. This is also the reason earlier when I was talking about sinus tachycardia, why um, I said that you want to watch if there's P waves present. Because once you get to the point where there's no P waves, usually I'm thinking, okay, this patient has supraventricular tachycardia. So the way to remember this one is it's fast, skinny, and regular. So it's a fast rhythm. So when you count the rate here, let's see, we could count this one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So this would be a rate of 170. If you don't know what I'm doing, I am timesing how many pointy things are by 10. That's how we count rate. So I have a rate of 170. Um, so I'm fast. Um, I'm skinny. So my QRS is going to be um, very skinny, which is less than those three small boxes. But you can just tell this is super skinny. It's very narrow. It'll make more sense when we get to ventricular rhythms here next. Um, but I have a skinny QRS and then I have um, a regular rhythm. So it's skinny, fast and regular. Um, so because otherwise, let's what if it was uh, if it was skinny, fast, and irregular, it could be atrial fibrillation. So anytime you're thinking an atrial rhythm, irregular, it's got to be um, atrial fibrillation. But if I have an atrial rhythm and it's regular for this semester, there is tons of other rhythms out there. But for this semester, if it's regular, fast, and skinny, it has to be SVT. Um, this is uh, what this stands for. So what, what's going on in SVT in the heart is the heart gets irritated and it commonly can happen because of caffeine, stress, um, you know, fluid and electrolyte imbalances, things like that too. Um, and um, what's happening is, is the heart is racing and um, it's moving faster than it's supposed to. And again, we worry about those really fast rhythm because there's not time for filling. Um, so when a patient's in this rhythm, sometimes they can be this rhythm. I've gone in and a patient's had a heart rate of 210 and they're eating a sandwich and they're just like, is there a problem? And I'm like, Are you okay? And they're like, oh yeah, I'm fine. And then I'm telling them, hey, you're in an abnormal rhythm. I need to start doing some tests and assessments on you. And they were like, can I finish my sandwich first? And I was like, honey, um, we got to look into this. Like, I know that you feel okay, but you're not going to be feeling okay for very, mu for very much longer. So Again, I want to check their stability. So the way we check a patient's stability with a dysrhythmia, so I'm going to go in. Um, you probably would want to say, oh, listen to heart sounds. But listening to heart sounds is actually not going to be a great um, assessment because what am I going to hear? I'm going to hear what I'm seeing on the monitor probably. It's going to be fast. Um, you know, uh, with a rhythm like this, I definitely want to see is the patient awake or not? What's their level of consciousness orientation? I want to look at their oxygenation. I want to look at their blood pressure. Um, you know, how, how are they feeling with it? Um, and there is kind of a um, uh, least invasive to most invasive uh, order that we go to here when we talk about supraventricular tachycardia. My goal is, is of course, to get it back to normal, but if not, if nothing else, I want to slow it down. And once I slow it down, it should be more of a sinus versus a supraventricular tachycardia. 
Um, but most of the time we are going to um, be converting this. We don't just let someone stay in SVT. This is not a rhythm where I'm like, oh, okay, I'll just watch it for a while and see how they do. Like, no, we're going to need to convert them out of this rhythm. Um, and so the first thing I'm going to tell them to do is I'm going to tell them to bear down like they're having a bowel movement. I'm going to have them blow into a straw that's in a cup of water um, or do something to create pr intra-abdominal pressure. And that's what a vagal maneuver is. So if you've ever heard those stories of like older people, and I'm not saying it's always older people, but people passing out while they're having a bowel movement. That's a lot of times because they're bearing down to have a bowel movement. And when you bear down, um, what your body does is it has all these pressure receptors inside of it. And um, when you bear down, they say, oh my God, there's all this pressure here. When you're pushing to have a bowel movement, um, it senses the pressure. So what it does is it, it, um, and actually lowers your heart rate to try to um, compensate for some of this extra pressure that it's feeling in your intra-abdominal area. And so it lowers your heart rate. So that's why this works for this. I have someone who has a really high heart rate, um, but doing a like, oh, bear down maneuver, it actually allows um, this rhythm sometimes to convert back to normal. I had an aunt who went into it and she was able to vagal herself out of it um, when EMS got there and she didn't even have to end up, uh, I think she still went to the hospital to get checked out. But um, yeah, you know, uh, um, and a lot of times it can stop a patient from needing to get um, a whole lot of treatment or at least more invasive treatments. Um, there are medications that can be used. Again, all, it seems all the medications all are A, B, C, D, E. Um, so the medication that we can use is going to be known as adenosine or adenosine, however you want to say it. Um, it's a special medication that's actually pretty interesting. It's the only medication that you're ever going to give. Um, and remember, you're not being tested over this, but I, I think it's good to start learning about this. And you're going to see this in practice because um, you're all going to become cardiac nurses, I know, um, is that you're going to see that um, the adenosine, um, what it's the only medicine that's given quick or fast IV push, you know, all other stuff. We're like, push slowly over two minutes. This one, the way it works, you have to slam it in. And usually you hit it, like you don't hit it, but you push it in fast. And then you're going to attach a flush, like your life depends on it and slam that flush in. And the reason it's like, give, it's supposed to be given over like two seconds. And the reason is because the way the medication works, you have to give it faster. It won't work how it's supposed to. And you push it fast. And then um, what should happen is the heart should stop. Um, and so, um, uh, the heart should always, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, the, if the medicine's working right in it, um, you know, you have to be careful because you're slamming this in. So you want to make sure you have a good IV in, um, if the medication works, the heart will actually stop, but then it will restart. And hopefully when it restarts, it's going to be in a normal rhythm. So think of it like when your computer's not working, you're like, I'm going to turn it off and turn it back on. Um, you know, that's uh, the same kind of um, mentality that this uh, this medication has. So that's adenosine. Um, and then if that doesn't work, then we also can do cardioversion. Or if a patient's super unstable, we're not going to, you know, sit around and be like, bear down. You know, we're going to be like, uh, okay, we're getting the, you know, um, cardioverter and, you know, go, it's actually on the defibrillator, but I don't want to confuse y'all yet. Um, but um, we're going to go get the crash cart and um, attach the pads and cardiovert them because this can be a very serious rhythm um, for some patients. So um, to sum up SVT, fast skinny rhythm, a regular um, rates usually going to be uh, greater than 150. Um, it can get up to over 200. I want to check their stability and then I'm going to coach them through doing a vagal maneuver or give medications or if they're unstable, do cardioversion. Um, so yeah, I think that's all I want to say about that. Let's do a case study about atrial rhythms. So we have John, he is a 77 year old man with a history of heart failure, CAD, hypertension, diabetes, and sleep apnea. He's got a lot going on. He had two knee replacements, two cents placed in the last year and his tonsils removed when he was young. Oof, got a lot of history. He came to the hospital today complaining of worsening shortness of breath. And so let's see, shortness of breath and feeling like his heart is fluttering. Hmm, what could this be? So he's got, let's see where my thing went got low BP, high heart rate, low O2, high respirations, and temp is, is fine. Um, so my assessment findings, apical and radial pulse are irregular. That's probably something important to note because um, there's only one rhythm we've talked about so far that's irregular. They're lethargic and sit, they feel dizzy which that could be for many different rhythms, but yes, the skin is cool and clammy and pale. Those are all signs of poor perfusion and they're short of breath, poor perfusion using accessory muscles to breathe. Well, it's supposed to be underlined, but you get the point. Poor perfusion, they're laying on their side and they keep moving to try to get comfortable. 
So what rhythm are they in? I don't have a strip for this one. So I have to think based on this story, what rhythm that they're probably in. So the give me here is this irregularity. So the only rhythm we've talked about so far that can be fast, cause poor perfusion, and that is irregular is going to be atrial fibrillation. Um, so he's most likely in AFib. I'm not going to write all the answers out here, but I will put this one in. It looks like he's probably in AFib. Priority actions are going to be to, um, you know, in general, priority actions for all dysrhythmias are going to be things like apply oxygen, get a 12 lead EKG. Because I mean, I can sit there and be like, Psh, his heart's fluttering. It's obviously AFib, but no, we need to get a 12 lead EKG. Um, I want to stabilize him the best that I can. Um, I already have a set of vitals, but I'm going to frequently monitor his vitals. Um, obviously, his oxygenation is down. So definitely applying that oxygen, um, getting that confirming with a 12 lead EKG, contacting the doctor, and um, getting treatment started for this patient is key. We want to get that rhythm converted if possible. If not, we want to get that heart rate down. Um, and then we are going to um, do things if we, especially if we can't convert the rhythm to prevent clotting. Um, biggest concerns are going to be that low um, cardiac output and low blood pressure. So poor perfusion. And then I'm also going to be worried about blood clots. So I think that's it. So here's another strip with AFib. Um, I'm going to ensure the patent airway, slow the heart rate, blah, 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 monitor vital signs. I think I said all this stuff. Yes, that is atrial fibrillation in a basket. Next, coming to a movie theater near you is going to be what happens when there's problems at the bottom of your heart. So we're going to start getting into lethal rhythms. I hope you're as excited as I am. See you there.